the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4, 18. And I'm Lonnie Belashenko, your host. As we 
continue exploring this subject, it's all about love. What an awesome reminder Anika just gave us in that powerful song, God So Loved. Let's begin this exciting, eye-opening journey to It's All About Love. Here is Logan. Just 12 years old. That's how old Jesus was when his parents took him as a child to Jerusalem for his first Passover celebration there. Sure, he was only 12, but his mind was sharp and he absorbed it all. He saw the priests in their white robes. His tender heart was touched. He heard the cries of those innocent lambs and saw them being slaughtered, bleeding victims on the altar of sacrifice. He saw the cloud of incense going up before God. Day by day, clearer and clearer, he began to see their meaning. Every act seemed bound up with his own life, his destiny. New impulses awaited within him. As his heavenly father connected the dots in his mind of his 12-year-old son, revealing the mystery of his mission as the Lamb of God. After the festivities ended, Jesus' earthly parents left town thinking he was playing with the other kids in their large traveling group. Big mistake! Jesus had wandered over to the school, next to the temple, sitting at the feet of the learned rabbis, doctors of the law. As this 12-year-old child asked them questions, they expounded on how the coming Messiah would liberate the Jews from their oppressors and made their nation number one. Then Jesus asked another question in the end. Their answer determined their destiny, and so too will yours and mine. Under inspiration, the prophet Isaiah wrote the passage. What does it mean to you? Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 7. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth.
And now, to share their personal story, here is Derek Morris. I have a confession to make. When I was a boy, I viewed the Ten Commandments as a list of prohibitions. Don't do this, don't do that. And even though the Fourth Commandment started with the word remember, I found a don't there too. Don't do any work. Somehow I came up with the idea that God would be happy with us if we complied with the list of prohibitions and very, very unhappy with us if we didn't. He might even stop loving us. As I learned more about the teachings of Jesus, praise God, I discovered that God's commandments can be summarized in two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus said, this is the first and greatest commandment. And then the second is like it, Jesus said. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The commandments are summarized, according to Jesus, in just one word, love. And our response to the commandments of God is also all about love. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. We respond in loving obedience because God is our awesome creator and our gracious redeemer. I went back to Exodus 20, where it lists the commandments, and I read the verse before the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And I found, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In other words, God says, I am your redeemer. I love you with an immeasurable and unfailing love. I created you and I have redeemed you. I want to protect you. I want to care for you. I want to care for our relationship. Now that is a journey worth cherishing. When I was 20 years old, studying at Newbold College in England, I met a remarkable young American woman named Bodil Chen. Her name caught my attention a Viking first name, Bodil, and a Chinese family name, Chen. I discovered her father was a brilliant young scientist born in the U.S. to Chinese parents who had completed his Ph.D. at age 21 and then went to the University of Copenhagen for a postdoctoral fellowship. He met a beautiful young Danish woman at church and later married her. Her name, Inge-Lisa Rasmussen. Now you understand how their firstborn had a Viking first name and a Chinese family name. Bodil completed U.S. high school and then decided to go on an adventure for her first year of college. She traveled to the U.K. and, praise God, she enrolled at Newbold College where I was studying. I first noticed her when she was singing with a girls' trio, and I immediately appreciated her melodious alto voice. So when I was asked to compose a song for a youth retreat, I asked Bodil to sing with me. I had no romantic agenda, I promise. At least I've never admitted one. I just needed an alto to sing with me. But as we sang together and as we prayed together, we became best friends. And she's still singing with me 40 years later. Our journey together has been and remains a beautiful journey. She's my best friend, and our relationship is more precious to me than fine gold. I want to honor and protect our relationship, and I would not deliberately do anything to damage that precious journey that we're on together. Why? All because of love. We're also on a beautiful journey with Jesus. Our loving obedience does not earn His love and care. We love Him because He first loved us. And our love relationship with Him is a journey that will last into eternity. great frontier of science, the human brain. The anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC, is that part of the brain right between your eyes 
and slightly back from your forehead. This region is where we experience compassion, empathy, love, and where we choose right from wrong. Right next door to it is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex where we reason and strategize. And beneath that area is the conscience. God's methods of love and truth stimulate and strengthen the anterior cingulate cortex to heal and grow. And it calms the fear circuits that are located in the limbic system of the midbrain. Worshipping an arbitrary, severe, punitive, vengeful, or distant God leads to activating the fear circuits in the midbrain's limbic system, and that area grows while the anterior cingulate cortex in your frontal lobe, that shrinks. And this results in chronic damage and inflammation to both brain and body. Scientists have discovered certain proteins produced in our white brain cells or the glial cells and the blood vessels and this is called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It works like a fertilizer for our brain cells, making our brain cells to grow stronger, to branch out, to, to connect and even to form new neurons, some think. But our body does not directly make this wonderful BDNF protein. It makes a longer protein or a precursor protein called pro-BDNF. And it has just the opposite effect of BDNF. The BDNF works as a fertilizer, but this precursor that we actually make, it works like a weed killer. So, if it binds to a nerve cell or to a dendrite branch, it kills it. The critical issue that determines whether the brain cell gets the fertilizer or the weed killer is the presence of this enzyme that cuts the long chain pro BDNF that we make so that it converts it from being a weed killer into a fertilizer. Got it? So where does this enzyme come from? Believe it or not, it is activated, it is made from the activity of the neural circuit itself. So if that nerve circuit is active and firing and is producing uh, a lot of work, it makes the enzyme. And this leads to making more fertilizer protein, which makes the circuit grow even stronger, recruiting more neurons and making more connections. But if the circuit is idle, it does not produce this enzyme. And so the weed killer pro-BDMF takes over and it starts pruning back and shutting down the circuit. Now you know why. If you've learned a foreign language, the more you practice it, the more that part of your brain makes the enzyme to convert the weed killer into fertilizer and, and the more your ability to speak the language. But if 20 years goes by and, and you haven't used it, what happens? The circuit hasn't been firing these 20 years, so the enzyme hasn't been produced. All you've got is weed killers. And this prunes back, shuts down that circuit. And before you know it, your fluency in that language is lost. The Bible also says we must bring every thought into captivity to Jesus. That's because if you don't, then all of those unhealthy neural circuits, those unhealthy thought patterns will not degrade because they're actively firing and recruiting more neurons. And you will not be transformed into Christ-likeness. On the other hand, when we spend a thoughtful hour each day reading from God's holy word and, and meditating on God's love and goodness, especially the closing scenes uh, as displayed at Calvary, as we see God's love outpoured, that will literally change our brains. You see, when love increases, fear decreases, and growth, development, and healthy thinking all improve. And remember, if you want to have a healthy brain, dwell on the love God has for you.
Welcome to our breakout or discussion question. This is the time in our study when we give you an opportunity for discussion, dialogue, and feedback. After sharing your opinions, we then look for answers in God's Word. So here goes, the subject of grace. It brings up a very important issue that many people don't understand. Romans 3.28 says that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So if you cannot earn your salvation by keeping the law, does that mean that the Christian is no longer supposed to keep the law? Imagine you're driving in a car at 70 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. A police officer pulls you over, you're guilty, the radar proves it, and you know it. You have no excuse. You tell the officer that you were coming to the Love at Work Bible Study Fellowship. And big surprise, though you clearly deserved a ticket with a hefty fine, the cop lets you go free. Without a doubt, you violated the law, but the officer showed you grace in that he didn't give you what you deserved. As a result of being shown grace by not being condemned by the law, from now on, what should be your response to be within the law? Take a moment and think through these options. A, seek to get the speed limit changed so you can drive faster. B, buy radar equipment so you can detect when the police are around. C, obey the law. D, obey the law when you drive off while the policeman is behind you and speed up when he can't see you anymore. Or E, ignore the law and the police and speed off, continuing to drive over the speed limit because you're not under the law, you're under grace. Or F, something else. Like what?
Okay, what do you think the right answer is? It's probably clear, it's option C. Just because we've been pardoned for violating the law, just because keeping the law can't save us, this doesn't mean that we are free to continue violating it. And that makes about as much sense as continuing to violate the speed limit after the police officer lets you go. The Bible says we are not under law, but we are under grace in Romans 6, 14. And that we are not under the condemnation of the law because we have been given grace. But it doesn't mean that because we are not condemned for our sins, we then keep committing them. There are a few problems we should point out with our speeding ticket illustration. As others have observed, it is easy to think that when God forgives your sins, that the change is in God and not in you. It's like thinking the police officer, for example, really wanted to give you that ticket, but he had a change of heart. But God is not the cosmic police force out to get you. He holds no grudge against you. When God's law of love, the circle of love, got broken by our first parents with sin and rebellion, immediately God's grace sprang into action to restore the broken relationship. This speeding ticket illustration also comes up short because it overlooks one key difference between our man-made speed limit laws and God's laws. Our laws are arbitrary. The speed limit can change. God's laws are eternal. His law of love, whether it is reflected in the law of gravity or in the Ten Commandments, does not, indeed cannot change. If someone jumps off from the fifth floor of a building to the ground below today or a thousand years from now, chances are something is going to break. But one thing I can guarantee that will not break is the law of gravity. In that sense, when we break God's law of love, the Ten Commandments, something breaks all right, but it's not the commandments that break. It's us. We break. We get broken and die. Here's Dwayne, and he has a follow-up question for us. Thanks, Jared. Paul wrote that the law doesn't save us. We are not under the law, but under grace. Well, if God's grace is always greater than our sins, why not keep on sinning so that there will be more grace? Well, let's notice how Paul answers this question in Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That is, we have a new life in Jesus, one where we have been promised victory over our sins, victory over the things that have caused such damage to our lives. Now, how are sin and death related? We find this answer in Romans 6 and verse 23. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember what the angel told Joseph? In Matthew 1 and verse 21, it says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God's salvation plan involves separating you, freeing you from sin, so it will not cause you to die. And here's the flip side. Just as sin and death are inseparable, so are righteousness and life. How can you get righteousness? Being goodish isn't good enough. You cannot try to live Christ's life. You have to invite him to come in so that Christ, the son of righteousness, can live it in you. Well, what else does the Bible say about God's laws? The Bible says in James chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. And now it's sing-along time. So as the Bible text appears on your screen, let's all sing.
A few years ago, some high school kids took down a stop sign and they did it just, you know, as a prank. Well, a truck went through the intersection and hit a car and killed three kids. The stop sign was an indicator of the law and the law said you stop at the intersection. Why was the sign there? It was for the good of the people. By obeying it, you reduce the risk of tragedy. So it is in the same way God's law is there. It's for your good. And just because keeping it cannot save you doesn't mean that you shouldn't still keep it. But sometimes you hear people say that in the new covenant, we are called to love God. If we do that, we don't have to keep the commandments anymore. Well, let's think about this. We love God, therefore we can now lie and steal and murder and take his name in vain? I mean, really, does that make any sense? We know the answer is no. I'm sure our friends who teach that the law was done away with at the cross don't really mean it at all. The Bible is clear about what loving God entails. What does the Bible say about how to show our love for God? Notice what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments She was, as they say, guilty as sin, caught in the very act. The prostitute, terror-stricken, was dragged from the bedroom to the courtroom, uh, well, to the temple courtyard. And back then, if you got caught, prostitution was punishable with death by stoning. Filled with shame and cowering in fear before her accusers, she heard the Galilean rabbi pronounce what to her was her death sentence. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her, Jesus said. After what seemed like an eternity of silence, she looked up to see her accusers leaving, one by one. Then the rabbi Jesus spoke again, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, no one, Lord. Jesus replied, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
Jesus is not in the condemning business. John 3, 17 says clearly, God sent not his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he says to the woman, neither do I condemn you. This is what's called grace, infinite grace. But he doesn't stop there. He bid the trembling penitent go and sin no more. This is law and grace and law to point out sin and grace to keep from sin. God's grace is greater than all our needs. Grace without the law is meaningless. Why would we need grace without the law? What would we have violated that we'd need grace to be given to us? And law without grace for sinners? That brings condemnation. Jesus came to restore, not to condemn. As we reach the climax of Earth's history, the devil makes open war on God's people and the relationship between faith and law, between grace and law. It becomes exceedingly important. This is seen in one specific text, one that shows how closely tied faith and grace and law really are, a text that talks about God's people in these end times. Now, how can you identify God's people at the end of time, a people ready for Christ's return? The answer is very simple and is found in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These people are saved by grace through faith. They have claimed the sacrifice of Jesus in their behalf and allowed their savior to restore their relationship of love. They reveal that faith through keeping his commandments. It's as simple as that. Jesus offers you a vacation package so awesome that it is out of this world. The destination is heaven. This vacation will be forever. And when will it be? 
very soon. How do we get there? By air? How much does it cost? A lot. I'd say more than a hundred trillion dollars per ticket. But remember, Jesus is the one giving you this vacation. It cost him everything, far more than the money of this world. He paid the price, and that's what God's grace is all about. So for you, the ticket is free. If you're interested, and who wouldn't be, I'm glad to hear. I know this offer sounds too good to be true, but I've checked it out and it's legit. I encourage you to check it out for yourself and join us on this journey. I remember hearing the story of Sam, a construction worker who happened to be working on a tall scaffold several floors above the ground. Well, as he was working, suddenly the unthinkable happened. Sam lost his footing, slipped, and began falling to a certain death below. Well, his fellow workers heard his screams, and as they saw him fall, they rushed downstairs to pick up his mangled body from the pavement. As they raced down the steps and ran outside, to their surprise, there came their friend, Sam, a little shaken up, but alive and well. well how is this miracle possible? Well, it just so happened there a few moments before Sam's fall, the local shepherd happened to be leading his flock of sheep through the town. And Sam, instead of landing on the hard pavement below, landed on the sheep instead. A lamb broke his fall. And the one lamb that broke the brunt of Sam's fall lay dead, but Sam was alive. The law of gravity was not broken. But one lamb was. The broken lamb paid the price that Sam might live. Friend, from the moment when Adam and Eve sinned way back there and fell, when their disobedience disrupted God's law of love, like the law of gravity, they too faced a sure and certain death as the natural consequence for their disobedience. The wages of sin is still death. He could no sooner change his law than he could the law of gravity. But God saw our fall, and in that instant, God's heart of love set in motion a plan that would send His Son to become the Lamb of God to take our fall, the one to bear the consequences of that fall. And because He paid the price, you and I can have life everlasting. God's law did not change, but on Calvary's hill, God's law of gravity met His law of kinetic energy, justice met grace, and the Lamb of God absorbed the full impact from the fall that should have killed you and me. He died your death that you might have His life. Oh, wondrous love. Friend, have you ever given serious thought lately about how much God loves you? Well, friend, God waits with open arms. Accept His gracious offer today. Take the water of life freely. 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, I confess and repent of my sins. I accept your gracious offer of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Until next time, remember, it's all about love. You shall love your God with all your heart. And with all your soul. And with all your strength and with all your mind, and, and love, love your, your neighbor, neighbor as, as yourself. yourself.